What's up, everybody? I'm David Hain. Welcome to episode 22 of the A to D from Addict to Disciple podcast. I'd like to give a big shout out to listeners from the island of Guam. That brings our total listeners to 27 countries. I also want to thank those of you who are sending anchor messages to me in response to podcast episodes. I really appreciate it, and I'll be playing those messages in upcoming episodes. If you have any questions, I'll get back to you personally and use the topic in a future podcast. When we come back, we'll begin our interview with Richard Sloster as he discusses re-entry into community and family after almost 12 years in prison. I'm happy today to welcome a good friend of mine from South Africa, Ricardo Sloster. Uh, I actually met him in Paulsmore Prison, not as an inmate though. I met him as he was the coordinator for a prayer walk in the prison. But today he's agreed to talk about his transition from prison life and re-entry into community. So the first question, Ricardo, I'd like to ask is, how did you work to undo the harm that you caused to your family members, your loved ones and community while you were incarcerated? Yes, thank you so much, David, for the opportunity, firstly. I want to greet everyone out there and those that are are going to listen to, to this podcast. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to share uh, part of my testimony. And uh, it really is an a honor and a privilege for me. I do want to start out by saying, you know, I don't see myself as as this great guy, um, I'm, what I am is just through the grace of God. And uh, so I give him all honor and praise because he's the one that, that transformed and renewed my life and also brought reconciliation even in my relationship with my family and my community and my friends. And uh, so, yes, indeed, it hasn't been an easy journey. But I do want to say that it was very well worth uh, the journey that I've taken and uh, the decision that I made way back in 1999. I decided that, you know, prison and gangsterism, uh, uh, addiction to, to drugs and all the rest, this is really not for me. This is not what I want for my life, although I found myself in some serious trouble. So, uh, yeah, so the question that you were asking me is in relation to my family. Now, yeah, like I said, it wasn't easy. Um, I think mainly, um, you know, people really want to not just hear that you have changed and by you just telling people, you know, I'm not that same person that you knew. I don't think that is enough. Uh, with my family, I, uh, I do know that they believed me, um, you know, when I said that I, that I changed, but still I had to prove that change. And I think uh, the change that people really want to see is that you are actually, um, you know, um, not only speaking about this change, but that you are indeed living out this change. And so this is my experience in my life and in the relation to my family that um, I had to really, you know, prove um, after all the lies, after all the hurt and all the pain that I caused them, I think, um, you know, I had to give them time to really, really believe in me, really to, to trust me, because I think a lot of trust has been lost uh, when, I, when I reverted to criminality and... Um, and, uh, you know, reverting to, to the use of drugs and becoming an addict. And so, yeah, so that wasn't very easy. The same with the community. Uh, like they say, it is time that will tell if you've really changed. And uh, right now, it's many, many years later. I was incarcerated in 1999, and I was incarcerated for 
almost 12 years because I was released in 2010. And so I'm 10 years that I'm a free man, that I'm outside of prison. Um, five years ago, I finished my parole. And so, yeah, so yeah, I am. I'm still on the, what they call the straight and the narrow path, David. Excellent, excellent. And I can say part of the change that your family probably saw is the Ricardo that I met. And I appreciate your your humility in saying you're you're not the great man or anything, but I can tell you when I met you right away, I knew I was meeting a good man with a great heart. Thank you, David. <laughs> yeah. So knowing that you you decided to change back in 1999 when you found yourself incarcerated, but still had mm -hmm. to serve 12 more years. What did you find when you got released as far as the difficulty in restoring broken relationships that you had hoped would have been restored just during your time in prison? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I had family that faithfully visited me for that entire period of time, uh, you know, for the 12 years that I was incarcerated. Um, but I think the greatest challenge probably was a challenge that I had um, with my son. So I had, a, I had a son, and when I went to prison, he was just about, um, you know, just, just about two years old. Mm. And, um, yeah, so two years old, and um, his mom used to come and visit me quite often, and he would bring him there. But, you know, uh, throughout that 12 years, I saw him actually growing. Um, because every time he would come and visit me, then, you know, you, he'll be a few inches taller. But, uh, <laughs> so, so um, you know, it was, it was really challenging because when I was released, um, you know, his desire was really that I, you know, that we should become, you know, a family. And things didn't actually work out between his mom and myself. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out. You know, we, we, we tried to make things work, but unfortunately, it didn't go that way. And so I had that challenge um, very early in my release, um, you know, where my son basically turned his back on me. Um, you know, he wanted nothing to do with me because um, I couldn't meet that expectation um, where his mother was concerned. And so, you know, that relationship, took many years, um, many of this uh, 10 years that I've been outside, you know, to restore and, and really get back together and, and make him understand. And, well, he's a grown man now. He's, um, he's 24 years old now. So he better understands, you know, um, you know how things work. And, and he's also got a child of his own now. Yeah, that so, must yeah. have been really, really hard because, you know, he spent, his early childhood with you incarcerated, but mm -hmm. hanging on to hope that when daddy gets released, we'll be a family again. Yeah. And yeah. I can see that hope just getting shattered all over again when the restoration between you and his mother didn't happen the way he was hoping. Yeah, no, certainly. How were you received by your neighbors and community when you got released? Did you go back into the same neighborhood, same community? Yes. Uh, David, when I was uh, involved in crime and criminality and drugs, uh, I didn't really practice that at home um, because I was living, um, you know, with my parents all the years. Um, but when I got involved with criminality, I actually moved away from home. Okay. And um, out of Mitchell's Plain, and I moved to Delft, and, you know, I really loved a, a life of, of, of crime and, and got caught up in addiction and all that. And um, so, yeah, so um, when I eventually got released, um, the neighbors and the community received me with open arms because... Uh, believe it or not, um, you know, you can be in prison 
But somehow, you know, news travels out of prison uh, into the community and people start talking um, amongst each other, um, you know, that, uh, you know, somehow, I don't know how, how it actually came out, but um, they already knew that I changed my life and that I'm on the straight and narrow, I'm serving God. And, and uh, when, they, when I came out, this is exactly what they saw. So obviously they were observing me and checking me out and they saw, no, this guy is genuine. You know, after a few months, they could see, you know, what I was really busy with. And uh, I didn't keep myself busy with any uh, gangsterism or uh, wrong friends and criminality. I think that's interesting that your crime and, and that that addiction side of your life was a half an hour away from the Mitchell's Plain community that was home to you. So you didn't have yeah. the direct victims to return to. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. You know, um, you know, David, um, you know, when you're speaking about uh, reconciliation with, with the victims, I actually had the privilege of doing a victim offender dialogue um, with one of my victims that um, years ago that I robbed um, of, of, of their possessions, um, mm. actually walking, walking into their home and gun pointing them and actually stealing uh, their goods. And it's something that I'm not proud of, but uh, amazingly, I had the opportunity that we were able to reconcile and serve the Lord together, ministering to those that were behind bars um, for at least uh, two years. Wow, that's great. That's great. Well, as a pastor yeah. now and, and back in the community, what do you say to the, the members of your church and what would you say to other church and community leaders about how they can be better prepared to welcome ex-offenders into their community as they get released from prison. Yeah, you know, I what I one of the things that I actually really realized, David, is that you know God has to really give you a a special grace to be able to work with certain type of people. Um, especially addicts and um, those that are being released from prison. Um, I believe that, and I believe this is the heart of God, that everybody deserves a second chance. And, and, um, third, and fourth. And, and certainly. Seven times seven. Cer certainly, David. I'm 100% I'm behind you with that. Um, if if only everybody believes that, <laughs> that's that's the only challenge that we had. And uh, I know your heart in terms of you know forgiveness and reaching out to people, but it's not everybody actually that that thinks that way. And um, so yeah, so it's 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 challenging working with addicts um, currently in our community. Um, yeah, the scourge of drugs has really taken over in our community. You know, people are onto heroin, they're onto uh, meth, crystal meth, and, and all kinds of drugs in our community. And you can, you can really see, you know, how this is really affecting not only the drug addicts, but families um, throughout our community are really being affected by drug addiction. And uh, our church's doors has been and still is very much open to reaching out to drug addicts. In fact, I just recently employed a, a gentleman. Um, he's 35 years old. Um, he comes from a life of drug addiction. He's been on the street. He's been homeless. Yeah, and then uh, I had a talk with him and uh, soon he told me, you know, he wants to turn his life around. And I told him, listen here, I'm going to give you a chance. At the moment, we are in, we are in need as a church of a caretaker. And we've got a little room here that we can house you that is in the church. And he looked at me with big eyes like, wow, in the church, you know, 
What did I do to deserve this? And uh, I welcomed him. We gave him a job. We helped him. Um, and he's back on his feet, you know, serving God. He's excited. Recently, we sent him to, I asked him, what is your passion? What would you like to do in the church? And he said, he's always had this desire to play drums. And then we sent him for drumming lessons. Excellent. And so he's now, he's now our church drummer and the caretaker of the church. And he is doing so good. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I hope to meet him my next time over in South Africa. Um, Certainly. Hopefully we'll, we'll bring the from A to D curriculum into your church and into the Mitchell's pay, playing community that way. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited yeah. about that, David. I've been through through the course, the Addict to Discipleship Discipleship course, and I can I can certainly I've still got the books, and from time to time I, I go through those books, and the material is excellent, so relevant, and um, I'm I'm excited to have you over here in South Africa, right here in Mitchell's Plain, uh, Cape Town, South Africa. We are certain forward to having you, David. Excellent. So in closing, Ricardo, what advice would you give to youth who are listening, who are getting drawn into drugs, alcohol, criminal activity, violence, gangs, whatever? The advice that I have for for young people, and that is really my heart, and, the con- and you know, it's really, really a, a major concern um, in our communities, because so many of these young people are being drawn into gang- gangsterism, um, especially, you know, coming from a background of poverty and, um, you know, not having role model fathers. And uh, my advice to these young people is get out as soon as possible. Break free. Run away if you must. But you need to get out of it. Um, And if you are deep in, uh, my advice is there is always a way out. You know, the gangsters here, um, even in prison, they've got the saying that they say there's there's a way in, but there's not a way out. There's always a way out. And I believe that God will make a way, even although there seems to be no way. So... My advice is turn to God because he will make a way for you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the A to D from Addict to Disciple podcast. I hope everyone has been encouraged by Ricardo's testimony and wisdom. Tune in Monday for our next episode as we discuss aftercare and answer the question, how do we walk with someone battling to establish recovery? If you'd like to contact me regarding a QA and a session on addiction, speaking engagements, addiction coaching or consulting, or to utilize the From A to D curriculum and podcasts in your location, please go on my website, www.fromatod.org, and click on the contact page, or leave me a message on Anchor. As always, stay safe and stay strong.